Um, hello, everyone. My name is Meng Wei, and this is Angela here. Uh, we are both software engineers from a Meta PyTorch team. And today, we're very happy to talk about ExoTorch, which is our new end-to-end -end stack that helps developers to deploy their PyTorch models on edge devices, which includes um, smartphones, smart wearables, and VR headsets, and so much more. So for developer journey, we are dividing the whole ExoTorch stack into two stages. First of all, we start with a PyTorch model, which in most of the cases, a torch.in.module. And then we capture the graph out of it, lower it, and serialize it into a ExoTorch binary. That completes our ahead of time compilation stage. And then we put a binary on device and run it using ExoTorch runtime. So let me pass to Angela that uh, she will talk a little bit more about ahead of time compilation. Yay, thanks, Feng Wei. So for the ahead of time compilation, there's mainly three steps that goes into this. First, export, two edge, and two executorge. So for the first step, we're given a um, model, like an NN module or any callable, and we'll pass it through PyTorch 2's uh, torch export to get a computational graph. So all of the, a list of all of the operations that are happening inside of this module, and this will produce a exported program, which we'll go into more later. The second step is to call to edge, which will produce this edge program, which is the entry point for most executors users to run their optimizations and transformations. And the last, last step will run to executorch, which will lower to a binary file with the extension .pte, and will pass that onto the runtime to run on your device. So taking a step closer, the first step is to export the model, where we will create a graph representation of this model. Um, this graph representation is an FX graph, which some of you guys might be familiar with, but it contains no Python semantics, allowing us to run on an environment with no Python runtime. Uh, this graph only contains operator calls, so if you're familiar with FX graph, there's no like call module, call methods, or anything like that, so it it's a very simple graph for us to use. And the artifact produced by export is a uh, exported program, which is very similar to a Torch NN module, which some of you might, might be familiar with. The graph that is produced, we'll call it the A10 dialect graph. So by dialect, we're referring to a variant of this exported program, um, which is defined by its operator set and some additional graph properties. So by A10, we're referring to that this graph only contains torch.ops.a10 operators. And there are also only functional operators, meaning there are no side effects or mutations. And this consists of around 2,000 or so operators. Some graph properties are that uh, the graph contains metadata, such as a pointer to the original stack trace from the original model, and also the output D type and shape of every node inside of the graph. We can also express dynamism on certain inputs and also control flow through these special higher order operators. To learn more, you can listen to the Torch Expert talk later in the afternoon. So quantization actually runs on an intermediate stage of export because it needs to work on a higher level offset that is also safer for generic cases such as training. So the workflow is where we first export to pre-autograd, which is a layer safe for training, run quantization, and then lower to the A10 dialect that we mentioned before, and then pass it through the rest of the executorch pipeline. So the API looks something like prepare PT2E with where users pass in a quantizer and then convert PT2E and then pass it to the rest of the stack. So the quantizer is something that is backend specific implemented and it tells users what is able to be quantized on a specific backend and how to quantize those. And it also exposes methods to allow users to express how they want to quantize this model. Um, if you're a backend and you want to learn how to implement this quantizer, you can listen to the following talk. So the next step is to lower to the edge program, and this is the entry point for both executors users to run their target agnostic transformations. At this point, we're working on this edge dialect, which contains only a core A10 set of operators. So this is around only 180 or so ops. So if you're a backend and you're trying to implement executorch, you only need to implement these 180 operators to be able to run most models instead of the previous 2,000 or so operators from the A10 graph. 
Additionally, this dialect has D-type specialization, which will allow the Executorch kernel library to build kernels based on specific D-types for a more optimized runtime. And we also do normalization on the inputs by converting all scalars to tensors so that these operator kernels do not have to implicitly do this normalization. Another entry point for this EDGE program is backend delegation, where users can choose to optimize and process parts or all of their program on a specialized hardware or backend. And this way they can leverage the performance of these specialized hardwares for certain parts of the graph. There's around three workflows for this. The first one is to partition and delegate parts of their graph, or we can delegate the entire graph, or we can do something of the combination of the two where we compose this delegated module into more um, top level modules. So taking a closer look into this, the first step is where users can pass in a backend specific partitioner, which will tell the user what operators are able to run on a sp specific backend, and the two backend uh, API will then partition the graph based on this partitioner, and then lower those parts into a lower backend module. So this module will then be passed to the runtime to tell the backend exactly what needs to be run. So it contains the backend ID, which tells us which backend we're running on, and a set of process bytes, which tells the specialized hardware what it needs to be run. And it contains the original module for debugging purposes. And then a second flow is to lower the entire graph to your backend, and then directly lower this to your binary, and then pass it on to the runtime to be run on your specialized hardware. And the third flow is we take this entirely delegated module and then compose it into other modules to be uh, reused in other places. And finally, we can then lower and save to Executorch binary file. And so this is where users can start running their backend specific transformations, such as fusing operators to a specific custom backend operator. And then we will run a custom memory planning pass ahead of time to determine how much memory this program needs. And in order to prepare the graph to do this, we will first run an out variant pass, which converts all of the operators to their out variants. And this makes memory planning a lot easier because for a typical operator like add.tensor, it will allocate memory inside of the kernel for the tensor that it is outputting. But if we want to do memory planning, we can, out, we can use the out variant, which expects a pre-allocated tensor to be passed in. And in the kernel, it'll just assign the resulting tensor to this pre-allocated tensor. And so we can then run memory planning, calculate the tensor lifetimes very easily, and then determine how much memory this program needs ahead of time so that we don't need to dynamically do that inside of the runtime. And so finally, we can lower to the binary with the .pt extension and pass it on to the runtime. So now, Mengwei will tell us about what happens in the runtime. All right, thank you, Angela. Um, hopefully, after all this, uh, we are able to get back a .pt file, and we are, we are ready to dive into our journey in the runtime. All right, um, let's assume that developers are able to follow all the steps that introduced by Angela hopefully like a snap of a finger, and we are able to get back a PyTorch, uh, sorry, Exotorch binary file. And now we think about some of the requirements on the runtime, like how do we actually run this binary? From a developer perspective, the first natural question they may ask is, does it even run on my target device? For example, some of them may have CPU, or some of them may have a DSP, or even microcontroller, or something else. We need to make sure ExoTorch runtime is able to compile and run on all these platforms. So that brings up the first requirement, which is portability. Now that we are able to compile the ExoTorch runtime on the target devices, the developer may come up, come up with a follow-up question, for example, hey, um, my, my target device has a very special configuration. For example, it contains two pieces of memory buffers. One is blazing fa blazingly fast, but very small. But the other one is very huge, but very slow. Does actual, actual torch runtime even support this uh, hardware configuration? I think that brings up the second requirement we have, which is customizability. We should be able to support all these um, customizations, customizations that our developer wants. 
okay, now the Ex ExaTorch program is able to run on the target device, the developer may not be satisfied because um, they really care about performance. Notice that on, the, on device AI is in a very res resource-constrained environment. So that means efficiency and performance is critical. So we need to make sure ExoTorch runtime is performant. Now, um, let me walk you through some of the things we have done to satisfy these um, requirements. Let's talk about portability, uh, for example. How do we satisfy the portability requirements? Some of the target devices, including different operating systems, different architectures, and even different tool chains. And our solution to satisfy all these requirements is that we hide system level details. We do that by providing a pl platform abstraction layer, which um, provides a, a set of unified APIs for basic functions such as logging and clock and abstract away a lot of the platform specific implementation details. Similarly, we also provide data loader as well as memory allocator for ExoSource runtime to talk to um, operating system as well as file system. Last, last but not least, we make sure our ExoTorch runtime stick to C++ 11, which is acceptable by most of the tool chains. All right, let's talk about customizability. Um, the the, the ExoTorch binary file is the only contract between ahead of time compilation and runtime. So in, in that sense, in order to support customizability, we have to design the schema of our binary file in a way that it only stores the high level identifiers. For example, we only store the operator names as well as memory pool IDs, but does not have any opinion on what actually is the kernel being run on the runtime as well as what is the memory pool that we are allocating at the runtime. So this way we open a lot of opportunity for customization. Let's dive deeper. Let's talk about kernel customizability. One thing that I want to highlight is ExitTorch is allowing user to bring in their own, uh, own kernels. We do provide a in-house portable kernel library for ExoTorch, but that is not designed to um, be optimized on performance. So we, we allow user to bring in their own kernels. The way, to, the way to register custom kernels is very easy. Developer only need to follow the core A10 operator schema for the naming convention, and then uh, we, they can use a build time tool to build a library for their um, custom kernels. And this library will help register their kernels into Excel Torch runtime. One more thing I want to mention is that if the developer is providing model level operator information, the build tool is smart enough to only register the necessary kernels for the model. This way, we are able to shrink down the binary size. A lot of the on-device environments have very special requirements on memory. So we provide this uh, object called Memory Manager, which allow users to do a lot of customizations. The memory manager provide two, uh, consists of two memory allocators. One of them is used during initialization, and the, one, the other one is used during kernel and delegate execution. In addition to that, we also provide a list of memory buffers for tensor memory allocation. That concludes our customizability. Now let's talk a little bit about performance and how do we satisfy the performance requirement. Basically, we make sure our ExecTorch runtime has very low overhead between kernel and delegate calls. That is achieved by uh, preparing the input and output tensors before execution. 
And the user only needs to pay the price once if they, if they want to um, run the model multiple times. The second, the second principle we are making sure execute torch runtime is doing is to keep a very small binary size as well as memory footprint. This is done by pushing a lot of the complex logic and dynamism uh, to ahead of time compiler and make, make sure the Exitorch runtime logic is simple. Last but not least, we also provide a, a set of very handy performance debugging tools, which is um, in this SDK. Let me talk a little bit more about SDK. Um, we provide several very useful APIs. One of them is called bundled program, where we can bundle the sample input to the model along with the model. And this enables a very fast validation on device. We also provide debugging and profiling tools. The profiler is able to connect the, um, the statistics back to the operator, provide a out of the box operator level pro profiling. This is very handy to figure out the bottleneck of our program. All of them are provided in Python APIs to, um, to make, make sure the developer is able to use them easily. All right, I, talk a lot, uh, I talked a lot about the components of our runtime, but how do we exactly connect them together and make sure it works? This is a diagram of the whole flow. Basically, we load the exotorch.pt file, and then we do a bunch of initialization, including load program and load method. And last, we can execute on it. We also use SDK tools to cover the whole flow, make sure that every step is correct. What are we doing in initialization? Basically, we are creating C++ projects, uh, sorry, C++ objects for PyTorch model concepts. As you can see, the root abstraction is called program, which resembles the NNDOM module. And one program may have multiple methods. One method may have multiple operators, which is um, the kernel object on C++. So when we load the program, we actually provide the data loader uh, interface to be able to load the binary file. Notice that we, we, have, we are making no assumptions on the file systems, so user can feel free to implement this interface on their, um, on their target devices. And load program will take this data loader and do some uh, sanity checks on the binary file. Next, user is able to provide a memory manager to the initialization stage. One thing I want to call out is that user can manage their own memory. The last step of the initialization is uh, called load method. Basically, the developer needs to provide the method name that they, are, they want to execute on along with the memory manager and load method will do initialization on um, the weights and the operators, initialize the delegate, as well as preparing the tensor. Now we finally go to the execution stage where it's a very simple loop to loop through all the instructions. Notice that the execution is able to handle control flow by jumping to a particular instruction and also, the arguments to each of the instructions are all e-values, which is a container type to wrap all the argument types. So what's happening inside of each uh, instruction? Basically, we unbox e-values to base types, such as tensor and scalar, and we call the kernels with, along with a, a context object, which allows the kernels to reserve temporary uh, memory as well as passing back error code and message. So that concludes our developer journey. 
feel free to check out our booth for a lot of the demos. Here we have Android and iOS demos, and also we provide um, a VR headset demo. And also uh, the tutorials on GitHub is available right now, so make sure you check that out. Thank you so much.